In this part of the course we're going to have a look at a sample database and I'm going to talk you through how to organize your data, edit the data and generate reports. So to do this I'm going to uh, open a database file that I know has got some uh, good data in. So I'll just go to open file and in this case it's sample database open. And in here we've got an example database for a hotel and conference center. So if I just enlarge those, you can see that the conference center is broken down into the site. So the client is the hotel and conference center. We've then got the sites, first floor, ground floor, and second floor. And then if I actually open those up, you can see the various bedrooms within the hotel are listed on there. And we've got other locations for housekeeping and things like that. So I can actually explore the, the sites and locations simply by clicking on the various sites and enlarging those areas. Now, if I want to see the assets that are actually within the database, if I actually click on the client, we start to see a list of assets in here. And these are all the assets for that client. And we can see if I scroll down here, can actually see all the items listed. Now, if I click on the particular site, it will then show me just the items from the site. And if I click on just the location, it will show me just the items from the location. Now, in this case, what we can see in the kitchen on the ground floor, we can see we've got the assets in here. And you'll notice that we've got the asset description, the asset ID, and the next full test date. You'll notice some of the items are highlighted in red and some in black. The items highlighted in red are out of date. So you can see that the next full test date has actually um, been exceeded. So those are out of date. These items are currently in date as we speak at the moment. You'll also notice that down the side here we've got a tick. That means that the item passed the last test. If there was a cross there that would tell us that the item actually failed. So we can see some basic information from looking at the, the viewing pane here. Now, at the moment, we've got the items, you can see by this, in ascending order. And if I click on that again, you'll notice that the little pyramid turns upside down and they're now in descending order. And if I click again, ascending order. I can do that with any of the fields, so I can actually put them in asset ID order ascending or descending and very usefully in test date order again ascending or descending so if I put it ascending I can actually see that the the items that are in date at the top and then go into the ones that are furthest out of date at the bottom so I can actually see what needs doing in that manner now if I look at the the actual tabs that we've got at the top, we've got asset description, asset ID, next full test date. If I click with my right hand mouse button on any of those tabs, it brings up a list. And on this list, I can select what other items I want in there. So if I wanted the um, Earth continuity results for those items, I can simply click on that and it will bring me up another field on there with the Earth continuity results. And I could actually sort ascending or descending by Earth continuity if I wanted to. So if I want to remove that, again, I simply right-click on the column and just untick the box. So by doing that, we can actually decide which items we want to display in the list and which items we don't. So it makes it quite easy to tailor the lists so you can actually see what items you, you want to in there and actually get that information. So we've got the items on here, and as I said, we can actually look at the individual location, the site, or the um, whole client. So I could click on the client, and then I could sort that by next full test date. And then we'll see, as we scroll down, we've got items that haven't been tested at all or haven't had a, a full test. They probably had visual inspections. And then goes down into the items that are due for testing, the red ones. And then we're into the black items as we go down. Again, usually we'll actually do this in ascending order. So you'll see on here the items going through. Keep scrolling through. You'll see them turn red at the bottom. Actually see these are the items that are out of date. Then items at the bottom that haven't had a full test date listed on them. 
So we can actually do that quite easily. And if we wanted to find a particular asset, for example, we could do the same by asset ID. And we could actually scroll down to find the asset with the correct ID number that we were looking for. We can also use, there's a little find function on here. So we can click on the, the binoculars there and use the find function. So if we wanted to find a particular item on there, so say we wanted to find a particular type of appliance. So let's have a look on here and say we wanted to find a soldering iron, for example. We could then actually go search through there and it will find the soldering iron for us. And then if there was another soldering iron, we could press find next and it will find the other one. So we can actually scroll through until it says there's no more assets on there. So we can actually use the find function to go through or similarly we could actually sort it by description either ascending or descending and then we could actually scroll down until we see the soldering iron on there and we've got the two soldering irons there. So it just depends which way we want to do it whether we want to do it by ascending or descending and whether we want to actually look for the items using the find or whether we just want to sort the items. Now there is a little filter here as well, uh, asset view filter. So we could actually say just show us items that need doing between certain dates. So that might be the start and end of the month or it might be a certain period of testing. Uh, we can say show items that are uh, overdue. So it'll just filter just to show us the overdue items. And we can also include visual test schedules in there as well. So again, items that are overdue visuals, we can, we can do those. So we can actually add those filters in if we wanted to to actually make it a bit easier to see what's going on on there. There is also a tab there for the last download only, so it will just show you the items that have just been downloaded, maybe from the previous day or something like that. So there is quite a few options in there to play about with to make sure you get the, the right information on the screen. Now, if I wanted to actually drill down into one of these particular items, we can then actually click on the item and it will open the item up for us and we can actually see that the item details shown there on the screen. So we can see the asset ID number and if we wanted to add it, edit the asset ID number we can do that. The description, we can either type in a new description or we can pick from a drop down if we wanted to. Asset group, so we could pick the asset group that it's been assigned to or see the asset group that it was assigned to. We could also see the site and the location, or we can pick a site and a location if we knew where that item was. Um, so we can do that. Now, if we've got um, a PAT tester like the Apollo 600 with a built-in camera, we would actually see a picture of the, the item here if we'd taken a picture of the item. But you can, if you haven't got an Apollo 600 and you wanted to add pictures in, we can actually add an attachment in there if we wanted to and put a picture in the box um, so that we can identify the asset and, and we can get that to appear on reports if we wanted to. So if you do say a digital camera or mobile phone, we could then attach those pictures onto the records that way round. In the advanced box, we can actually add in things like make, model, serial number, and we can also see test codes. Um, if there's been produced with a, a supernova or Europa, we can actually have the test codes there and it'll tell us, tell us what test codes we used. There is a little box down the bottom here for notes, so if we wanted to make any notes about that particular item, we can we can add those in there. Now, the next area that we've got on here, really the, the sort of next box down, talks about the frequencies of tests and when the tests were done. So we have got the ability on here to perform a risk assessment on this item if we wanted to. So if I just click on there, and what we can do is actually answer the preset questions and fill in for where the item is, whether it's class 1 or class 2, whether the users are trained or not, whether the mains cable is enclosed or exposed, frequency of use, and eventually we get down to a risk assessment at the bottom and it actually tells us in this case this item is high risk, mainly because it's used by the public, and a visual inspection is recommended weekly and a full test every six months. Now what we could do with this is we can actually, if, you, if I change that to offices and shops, 
you'll see the frequencies actually change on there. So what it's doing, it's using the items you've put in here as an assessment of risk, and then basically that is affecting the items on here. Again, we could attach a photo to that if we wanted to. So if I just OK that, you can now see we've got the risk assessment has been added on here. And if ever I want to see the risk assessment again, I can just oops, just click on that and it will bring the, the risk assessment back up. Now, because I've done a risk assessment over here, we can now look at the test options. So at the moment, the full test frequency is set to user-defined, so that's been set with the PAT tester, and it's user-defined 12 months. So that's giving us an next test date um, 12 months on. Now, what we can do on here is actually we can change that to no retest. So if this was just a one-off test item, maybe done for a, a member of staff just on a piece of equipment that was just done once, or a visitor maybe, no intention to retest it, we can set it to no retest. User-defined, as we said before, gives us the opportunity to put in the dates we want. Group default means it will take its cue from the asset group it's been assigned to. So if we assign this to an asset group, um, hotels portable equipment, class one, then if I set the group default, it will take its cue from the group and change the frequency accordingly on there. I can also set it to as risk assessment. So what it will do now is take its cue from the last risk assessment that I've performed. So in this case, I could just set both those frequencies, the formal visual and the full test to the risk assessment, and it will take its cue from the risk assessment fields on there. So I've actually got risk assessed frequencies. So again, we've got various options we can set the frequencies to, and that will just uh, be picked up then in the table and in the reports. Next little box we've got here is on hire. So I can tick the on hire box and say it's on hire to Kevin, to me. Um, and then if I do one of the report variants, we can actually see which items are on hire. Um, and we can use that just to track where these items are. Let's remove that for now. We've also got a little in service box. So again, if something was taken out of service, maybe for repair, we can actually untick the box and one of the report versions we can actually do a report to see what's in service from that side of things so again we can use that box if we wanted to for that purpose the only other thing really to look at on here um, is we've actually got test results so we've got a test that was done on the 18th of the 12th 2015 and basically it, it records the test id it was a full test it passed and it was done by me kevin so what i can actually do on this now if i double click on that it will actually bring up the results of that test. It tells me it was done with a Supernova Elite, the serial number of the tester, the test codes used, the results of the visual, insulation, leakage, touch leakage, and load tests that were carried out. Uh, there's even some little comments in there that it's an uh, IKEA, it's the make of the lamp, and uh, I presume that's the model number on there as well. So. We could also have a picture on there and we could attach a picture for that test if we wanted to. So if using the Apollo 600, we'd actually taken a picture, that again would show up there. So we can actually see the individual test results. So as we go through testing the item year after year, time after time, this will actually grow and we'll see a history of the item there and we'll be able to look at each test that's been carried out on it, each risk assessment has been carried out on it as we go through. So that's really the asset details tab. That's really the, the nuts and bolts of looking at the details for each item. So we've got the, the items on here. We've been able to look at the, the details for the items. Now, how do we actually get the information out? How do we actually, um, you know, work with this information? And really, that's about this tab, the data transfer tab. So if I just click on the data transfer tab there, you'll see we've got options there. Now, we've already used the download and upload previously, uh, but what we're going to do is have a look at the other options on here now. So it just depends what you've got clicked on on here. So I've just clicked on the, the client there, and it's brought these items up. If you do get any items that are greyed out, sometimes you might just need to click on a different different option just to be able to get that that to come up but generally most of the, these items should be available so we've got options on here we can export to file so what we can do if somebody actually said to me 
I'd like a list of everything that's in the kitchen on the ground floor. I can click on the kitchen ground floor. I've got my list here. I can sort it how I desire. So again, ascending or descending. I can pick which items I want to actually see on here. And then if I click export to file, what it will do is it will actually create a CSV, which is basically a spreadsheet file. And it will create a spreadsheet with just this information on it. So that's really useful if I wanted to use that in another report or I want to send that to a colleague. I can basically create that information straight in there. Now I can also do that with this uh, little tab here again. And what that does, that creates a .pat file, .pat file. And what that means is that I can actually then import that back into PatGuard um, just simply with the open function. I just go on to open file and I select on here a .pat file. It's a pat briefcase file and I can actually bring that information, import it back into a database with that information um, that I've selected. So in this case we can export to file so we can create a file, a CSV file, a spreadsheet file or we can create a .pat file. Now taking that on a step we can actually create an email. So what this will do is the same thing, it will create either a .pat or a CSV file based on the information I've selected here but it will launch your email program and actually attach that onto the email. So if a colleague has asked you for a list of everything in the, the kitchen on the ground floor, we simply select this, we would click on CSV, uh, email file, and it will launch my email program, and I can actually just put in the address of the person, a quick message, and send that off. So that's actually quite a useful function there to be able to pass information to a colleague very, very quickly. Next option we've got on here is actually import CSV. So this is import a CSV file. So what this means is that if we've got previous PAT data or, or a, a customer or um, colleague has actually given us PAT data in the form of a spreadsheet, but we want to bring that into PatGuard, it might be old results and things that we want to bring into PatGuard, we can actually do that by importing a CSV file. Now the CSV file needs to be in a certain structure. And to give you an idea of the structure of it, we've actually included in the program files for PatGuard, we've actually included the CSV structure in there. So I'm going to show you a little tip of how to find that now. So if I just go to Explorer, which is my um, computer's layout, and if I actually go into my C drive, and I want my program files, and in my program files, I have a file called Seaward and PatGuard3. And down here, we can see import template.csv. And if I just open that up, this is actually a template that we can use to import data in. So it is very critical if you're going to use the template or you're going to actually try and import any data from a CSV file that you do actually lay it out exactly the same here. Use the same fields with exactly the same name, the same structures. It is quite picky. So where it's got, for example, lowercase m for months, make sure we use lowercase m for months. The date structures and things like that use exactly the same and it will import that thing in. So you don't need every field in there. You, you, know, you don't have to fill in every field, but you can make your data match this layout and then import that data in straight from a CSV. So it's useful to know where that file is and like I say use that as your basis for any imports that you do and you'll be able to import data directly from a CSV file straight into PatGuard which is which is a, a really useful function. So to do that all we would do is click on here and then just select the file that we wanted to import import it in and it imports it in very similar to doing a download and it will bring that data into PatGuard for you.